Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. I want to extend a good evening and welcome uh, to our panel discussion this evening regarding reopening schools safely in the era of COVID-19. I would like to thank you for joining us. Uh, tonight, we've assembled a very distinguished panel of medical, health, and education experts to share their thoughts about COVID-19 and safely educating our children. Uh, before we start, I want to extend my heartfelt thanks to our guests uh, for the work that they do day in and day out in our community to provide the essential services that they do. I appreciate your efforts uh, to spend time with us tonight, and I'm extremely um, honored uh, to be joining you tonight. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to start with um, some introductions um, of our panel. Um, we'll go just brief introduction of each of our panelists, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Lee Atkinson McAvoy. Uh, Dr. Atkins Mac McAvoy is the Division Chief of Pediatrics at UCSF and the Vice Chair for Pediatric Primary Care and Population Health. Dr. Atkinson is a skilled and compassionate pediatrician with a breadth of ex experience and quality improvement uh, pediatric population health. Dr. Atkinson McAvoy is a well-known leader in pediatrics across the Bay Area. Uh, welcome, Dr. Atkinson McAvoy. Uh, next up, we have uh, Dr. Jackie Chia. Ch Ch excuse Chaya, me. Like Chaya. <laughs> and we were just talking about it. Dr. Chaya uh, is a passionate and thoughtful community pediatrician with leadership experience at the Ravenswood Family Health Center. She is also a member of the local American, Pediat American Academy of Pediatrics School of Health Committee and has advised neighboring school districts and the San Mateo County Office of Education. Dr. Chaya also speaks on the topic of safe school reopening at Stanford Children's Hospital. Welcome, Dr. Chaya. Uh, our next panelist is Liz Sanchez. Uh, Liz is a community program specialist and represents the San Mateo County Health System. She has been with the San Mateo County Health System since 2013 and specialized, specializes in training in nutrition. She has served as the lead for school wellness initiatives and is currently serving as the education liaison for the San Mateo County Health. Uh, welcome, uh, Liz. Uh, next is my colleague, uh, uh, Nancy McGee. Uh, Nancy is the San Mateo County Superintendent of Schools and has been such since 2018. Superintendent McGee serves on the first five San Mateo County Commission, the Housing Endowment and Regional Trust of San Mateo County Board, the Home for All uh, San Mateo County Steering Committee and the Big Lift Leadership Team and is co-chair of the San Mateo County Child Health Partnership Council. She has been the leader for the county school districts during the pandemic and a, a very thoughtful leader in school reopening. Uh, personal thank you uh, to Nancy for all the work that she's done to support our district. Next is Dr. Monica Gandhi. Uh, Dr. Gandhi serves as the medical director of the Ward 86 HIV clinic since January of 2014. And she won the HIV Medical Association Clinical Educator Award in 2017 and was awarded a, the Master Clinician Award in the Development of Medicine in 2019. She is an expert in virology and masking, bringing us an expert perspective on SARS-CoV-2. Uh, welcome, Dr. Gandhi. Next is Dr. Manpreet Singh. Uh, Dr. Singh is Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Scientist and Director of the Pediatric Mood Disorders Program in the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychology, Psychiatry at Stanford. Uh, she directs Stanford's Pediatric Mood Disorders Program, which is an integrated multidisciplinary clinic that aims to treat youth with a spectrum of mood disorders. She brings the important perspective regarding the mental health of children as it relates to pandemic and school reopening. And finally, uh, Dr. Charlotte Shea is a pediatric infectious disease specialist. She is currently practicing at UCSF uh, Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland. She brings the valuable perspective uh, of the special considerations needed 
for COVID disease and transmission in the pediatric population. Uh, welcome to our very distinguished panel. And again, thank you for joining us. Um, I'd also like to take a moment and give him a round of applause. <laughs> thank you, Nancy. I'd also like to take a moment to uh, welcome our moderators. Uh, the moderators for tonight's discussion are, are Dr. Neil Patel and Dr. Jim Howard. I'm incredibly grateful to you both um, as you've worked exceptionally hard to bring this distinguished panel together tonight. Thank you both. Uh, Dr. Neil Patel is a community pa pediatrician and leader at Palo Alto Medical Foundation at San Carlos. He also serves as a medical advisor to the Pandemic Recovery Framework for the San Mateo County Office of Education and as a regional representative for the American Academy of Pediatrics and School Health Committee and a first five uh, commissioner for San Mateo County. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patel. And finally, um, our own, uh, Dr. Jim Howard um, is a pediatric intensive care physician at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland, and a member of the Board of Trustees for the Belmont Redwood Shores School District. Um, he's been working, uh, caring for children with COVID in the hospital setting. Uh, he's enthusiastically committed to every student um, and their success in the Belmont Redwood Shores uh, School District. Uh, welcome, Jim, and again, thank you. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Jim. Thanks, Dan. Um, uh, welcome, panelists. Um, I also want to echo um, Superintendent DeGuara's sentiment about the honor we feel by your participation in our panel discussion this evening. Um, in terms of this evening's event, uh, we want it to be just that, a discussion amongst panelists. Our hope is that you will feel free to ask one another questions and really rip off one another as we work through some of the questions submitted to us from parents in the district and ideally invoke a deeper conversation and understanding of COVID-19 and its impact on children and families' health, well-being, and the challenges of the current and potential hybrid learning environments during this era. Uh, we have roughly 11 questions submitted to us in advance that we've selected for you to consider. Um, we will take turns asking one of you to be the lead off discussant. But again, hope that um, you all feel free to jump in and generate a collegial discussion amongst uh, the panelists. Um, for approximately the first hour, we will focus on uh, pre-submitted questions, uh, the content of which may have been modified to speak to the expertise of the, on the panel. Um, this discussion is meant to apply broadly to the region and questions specific to our district will be tabled to an FAQ document uh, to be presented later. Uh, we will also allow time to field questions from the chat, which will be viewable to the panelists in real time, but not the public. Dr. Patel will be monitoring the chat and I will moderate the discussion. Uh, we don't predict that we will have time to address every question submitted ahead of time or in the chat, but we will do our best to address um, the concerns in an FAQ document. Um, the, also, the panel discussion tonight will be recorded and made available to the public. And we're also uh, live streaming on a YouTube channel as we speak. Um, so with that said, uh, uh, let's get going. Uh, the first question I have uh, is for um, Superintendent McGee. Um, so I apologize being a pediatrician, I tend to uh, speak in people's first names as opposed, as opposed to their last names, um, but uh, I'll try to be, do my best to refer to you as Dr. This and Dr. That, um, but I'm so used to saying Neil and uh, Jackie and, and Lee, uh, I may uh, alter. Um, so uh, Superintendent McGee, some school districts in the region and county have been allowed to open uh, to a hybrid format, uh, while some remain closed. Is it possible to track infection rates in the community associated with school openings? And if so, will that information be made available to the public? In other words, it would we, we're really interested in learning from the experience of other school districts as um, they move to a hybrid format um, in this uh, situation. Yes, thanks for that question. Um, I would first say that school communities are determining for themselves um, whether they have the um, will to return students to on-campus learning. Um, some communities have determined that they want particular data points evident in their COVID data locally before they will open, but by doing that, they've really sort of limited their options to open at all. 
Um, so those uh, communities who've been working hard, including Belmont Redwood Shores, um, all, all communities have been working hard, but um, some with the intentional purpose to get kids back on campus. And so um, the contact tracing protocol that we've developed in collaboration with County Health, and thank you, Liz, for all of your work every day, um, involves uh, the districts when they have a positive case, they call it into communicable disease, um, as is the protocol for um, that we've developed through County Health. But they also inform the county superintendent. So we are keeping data at the county um, and we are able to, we've been tracking it since March. Now that doesn't mean that we have every single case documented but we have a pretty good handle on what we're seeing. And this reflects, and this is where the doctors can jump in on the research, but it reflects the international data that I've been seeing, the national data, and also backed up by the local experiences that when kids go back to school and, and staff and teachers are all together, um, when they're implementing the four pillars and using all the safeguards, we are not seeing community spread in the school community. Um, people are um, getting, you know, coming down with COVID, but that it's usually coming from the birthday party that they attended or the camping trip they went to over the weekend. And there's so many safeguards in the school community that people are getting, um, they're identified as they come into school, either through the health screening or the testing. Um, or they're communicating uh, their results to the school leaders. So the question is really about, can the data be made public? And um, this is the big question statewide. I was on a call today with all the 58 county superintendents and the governor is actually discussing um, putting up a, a statewide dashboard for schools. There was a lot of discussion about this. Um, it's one thing to note that schools are open, they're in hybrid or how many kids are on campus and that kind of data. It's another to report um, positive cases. Some school districts are literally so tiny um, that it can't really be equitably applied and still maintain the level of confidentiality that's really required. So I would, I would encourage everyone to lean on the citywide data that the county is producing and um, districts also notify their communities when they have a positive case. So um, I don't think we'll be publishing um, COVID data by school district uh, as a systematic uh, response. So, um that, that uh, begs a follow-up question. So how do we know what's working and what's not working um, if we don't have access to the data? And uh, you know, as an individual district, then you're trying to make decisions based on um, what other people may or may have done, not done successfully. Well, like I said, we're seeing very little, there's literally no community spread happening that we've seen um, since March. And, um, and so the four pillars of, you know, wearing your face covering, using your health and hygiene protocols, um, physical distancing and limiting non-essential gatherings, trying to use outdoor spaces, you know, opening your windows, all of those things actually work. And it's not any one thing. I think it's all, all of them provide layers of safety. And, um, and so, I, it seems to me that schools are much more controlled environments than a grocery store, a Costco, um, you know, a, a gas station, being out in public schools, everyone has eyes on. And um, we're just not seeing community spread, which is someone's asking about defining that. So one of the doctors, I don't know, uh, there's so many of you, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't be the one to pick you. Um, Nancy, I can add a comment um, yeah. that's mm -hmm. along that line that would be helpful. Um, when I think about data and making it publicly available, um, I, I think it is, is difficult, like you said, partly for privacy reasons, that if you have small districts, it may start to pinpoint them or highlight them a little bit too much. But also, we know that 
cases that occur in schools are often from the community. So you would expect that if community prevalence increases, you would have more cases that you know show up within the school members. But what is important to note is the spread. And so, you know, as a school district, we're not trying to prevent COVID from ever happening in anybody um, that is a member of our district, but we're trying to prevent it from spreading once they're at the school. Um, and I do think that would be interesting data to know. And I know that the county's collecting it because they are doing that contact tracing, um, but I understand the privacy reasons. Um, but just as one example, I know that within San Mateo County, um, Head Start, the Head Start preschools, you know, are being very closely followed because they have a very close relationship already um, with the county and they've been open through the pandemic and there have been isolated cases that have popped up in the preschools, but like you said, there's been no documented spread. And so what we mean by spread is that one student or one teacher or a community member of the school has COVID-19, enters the school and then gives it to another school community on those school grounds. And so that is considered spread within the school. And that is exactly what our mitigation strategies are trying to prevent. Um, and so when uh, Superintendent McGee says there's been no spread, what she means is you know, no spread of that COVID within the school uh, grounds itself, meaning that the mitigation factors are working. And that is really the critical thing I think that we need to be looking at. Yeah, and let me just share that there's eight public school districts open in hybrid learning right now eight more getting ready to go in person um, in the next uh, four, six, uh, eight weeks or so. Um, so all but really our high school districts are um, either already serving kids in person or preparing to do so. So thanks so much for that. Um, let's move on to another question here. Um, so this one, I, this one is for Dr. Shea. Um, and it's sort of a pediatric ID question. Um, I have two for you that are sort of related. So is there a difference in transmissibility and likelihood of infection based on age? In other words, when we think of, when we group children in a school district um, or in learning groups, uh, is essentially infants and toddlers, preschoolers and kinders, elementary school children up to say like fifth grade, and then preteens and adolescents. So six through eight and, you know, uh, uh, ninth through twelfth. Um, so, of those groups, um, is it does transmissibility change with age, and likelihood in, of infection uh, based a uh, change based on age? Great. Thanks, Jim. Um, thanks for inviting me to join you. Uh, join you guys for this uh, panel. Um, it's a real privilege to be here. Uh, I just want to sympathize with all the parents out there having two of my own kids and being home from school um, and trying to juggle work and parenting and, and school is a, an extreme challenge. So, so I agree that in, we have to try to get our kids back to school, but we have to do it in a safe way. So that all comes from having knowledge um, and understanding of this virus. And you know we are many, many months into this pandemic now, and we are constantly still learning more about this virus and how it's transmitted. Um, how it is spread in our community, and what behaviors we can do, the choices that we make as adults and as children can affect the community spread um, of this virus. Um, in, in these months that we've been studying this virus and within our country and from other countries as well, because we do have a, a lot of data coming from other places that have worked hard to contain this virus, um, and understanding more about the science of the virus itself and how it's spread. Um, we have come to understand that younger children seem to have a slightly less chance, lower chance of transmissibility, not zero. It's really important to know it. it's not zero. We do know that it seems that children who are less than 10 years of age seem less likely to spread the virus than say children above 10 years of age, teenagers, adults, and so on above. Uh, we think that has something to do with um, certain receptors that live uh, are part of our nasal tract and our respiratory tract. This particular virus has um, certain um, characteristics on its surface that have to bind to our bodies to actually cause infection. And so uh, these receptors are key in for this virus to actually attach to us and cause infection. So if you have less of these receptors, 
we might be slightly less likely to have this virus attached to us and cause infection. So, so in kids less than 10, we think there's a lower rate of infectivity transmissibility for that. That being said, there's been report after report of, of children being able to spread this virus to their households you know, if they do require this virus. So the, the, the rate is not zero. We can't go around, there's no absolutes, I think, in with, with regards to this virus. I think it's, it's so much easier to say it definitely does or definitely doesn't. But I think the reality of it is it, it's all a, a gradient. It's all a, 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 a based on risk and, and level. And it's hard to quantify exactly how much risk there is for that. Um, we, we do know that, um, um, your rate of infectivity or the risk of transmission not only has to do with your age, but also how much contact you have with the other person that you're transmitting, potentially transmitting to. So if you're talking about young children, um, infants, um, they, they can be infected by this virus. We do know that babies born to moms infected with COVID can actually have the virus detected in them. We have babies in the newborn nursery that we find that. Now, interestingly, they're not super ill. They don't display necessarily a lot of symptoms, but could their secretions be infectious? Well, it depends on how you're interacting with the secretions. If you're a, an adult holding the baby and really close and you're getting their secretions on you, then yes, your, your, your chance of getting that virus, you know, that infection from that baby is higher than someone who is not necessarily that close. So it's how much virus that person is shedding um, and how much contact you have with that person, how close you are, how much droplet spread that you have with them. So, so it, it, it's multifactorial to determine sort of how much is spread. Now, a lot of people worked really hard to, to you know, come up with plans and strategies to try to mitigate that, to try to minimize the amount of spread that goes from person to person. And we know for a fact that it's challenging to put masks on little kids. We don't, the CDC does not recommend masking on kids less than two. This is not something that is practical. Um, but also we feel that as long as you are protecting yourself and mitigating your risk, you're not as likely to have uh, infection acquired from that infant if you're taking the proper precautions to take care of them. Um, in, in preschoolers and, and kindergartners, it, it can be a challenge. You know, it depends on sort of the maturity of the child in terms of their ability to spread the virus to others. If they're a very orally, mouthy, and touching things, theoretically those droplets, if infected with the, the virus, can theoretically spread if other children are taking those same objects and putting it in their mouth as well. So that, that is definitely a challenge um, and maybe somewhat unrealistic to expect that the, some preschoolers won't have that direct contact because we can't always expect them to wear masks. Some, some preschoolers and kindergartners are actually really good you put a mask on them and you tell them to do it, they'll actually follow directions. They want to do the right thing um, for the most part. Um, and so, you know, the, with, with that amount of virus and the amount of contact, I think that um, um, is challenging depending on different levels. Um, in terms of elementary school kids up to about age 10, um, I can get my kids to wear masks. I think they want to follow directions too. Um, I think that, that because they don't shed virus as much, we may have more opportunities to be able to introduce um, small cohorts, cohorts of children together in that sort of elementary school age. But the challenge occurs when we hit that 10 year old level and the ACE receptors, these ACE2 receptors start to um, be at higher levels and we start to be potentially more contagious as we get older. So middle school, high school, those are the ages where we start to become just as infectious as the adults are. Um, and then the other challenge, which we can speak to later is the does your middle school student want to wear a mask at school when all their friends are telling them not to wear a mask at school? The peer pressures and the social issues are, are very challenging. And, and there are cases, we've seen pictures in the news of you know, pictures through a high school and you know, hallway and seeing a lot of kids without masks. So it, it, it's, it's a challenge in that we want to, to have our children wear masks and, and, and mitigate those droplets that we believe are the vehicle for spreading this virus. Um, and so it requires them to be actively wanting to do that, to, to wear the masks to try to, to mitigate the spread. Um, in terms of actual transmission rates, I think the percentages are a little bit hard to quantify because I think depending on what study you're looking at here and what study you're looking at there, you know, what are the hardcore percentages? It's, it's, it varies depending on what groups you're looking at. Um, just some general numbers. Um, 
people who live in the same household are more likely to spread COVID to each other. Why you're in the same household, you're in the same air, you're not outside. So some ballpark numbers may be something like 10% risk of spread in the household. But that number changes depending on who lives there, how closely they have to interact with each other to take care of each other. So more interactions between adults and young children, more spread of droplet particles. Um, Non-household non spread is maybe somewhere like 2%. So, I mean, again, these are sort of estimates, um, but just so that, you know, you are more likely to get COVID if someone brings it back into your household. And you're more likely to, to bring COVID into your household if you are the adults that acquire it in the community and bring it back. But, you know, it, it's, it's a challenge for all of us um, to face. Um, and um, um, we have to just keep working together to try to continue good education. And it is really hard to keep doing this. You know, when we first started talking about this pandemic in February, January, when this was first breaking out, we, we kept telling ourselves in infectious diseases, this is, this is a marathon. You know, this is a marathon. This is not gonna end, you know, quickly. This is going to drag itself out until we have um, definitive immunity from, from vaccines, which are not too far away. They're, they're right over the horizon. We're gonna start being able to roll some of these vaccines out. But until we actually can get protective immunity from a vaccine source, you know, we have to continue these measures to prevent the spread of virus in our community. And it is a challenge, it is, it is a challenge. Can I just riff off of what you just said, Dr. Shea, about um, a lot of your risk mitigation strategies involve behavior modification. And so I want to just emphasize that so much of what we're trying to do um, to uh, prevent the spread has to do with agency. And um, so much of that also has to do with um, the developmental stage. Now, of course, we may not be talking most uh, uh, today about um, early childhood. We understand, you know, even preschoolers have a very egocentric worldview. They think that the pandemic is their fault. Um, and so, you know, so think about from the other perspective, just how behaviors um, might actually um, uh, be contextualized based on the developmental stage of a child. In middle school and elementary school, kids are likely to show other behavioral changes that might impact their agency to wear masks or, or not. Um, and, um, and same true for adolescents who are much more engaged with risk-taking behaviors in general. They're predisposed to that. And they're also the most vulnerable to um, social isolation and the impact of social isolation because this is when um, autonomy and independence and cultivating um, social development is, is most important in, in, the, in the life cycle. So um, keeping that developmental framework in mind, I think is very important for, um, for all of us as we think about about risk mitigation in the context of behaviors. And I just wanna add, um, I completely agree with that, Dr. Singh, but I also wanna bring up the issue that um, many households have multiple people. And while we're thinking about going back to K through 12 education, there may be a younger child at home who's in preschool. Um, parents are going out into the world and interacting with people. And so the risk, if you're thinking about the risk to your child, the sole risk isn't school, right? The risk is school, but it's what their classmates are doing. It's those circles of connectivity and what's happening. And that's why it's important to really think about things, you know, as people have done play dates and distance learning and someone asked about the purple levels. And I know a lot of us in healthcare are really worried about Thanksgiving behaviors and what happened and what we're gonna see in the next two weeks is that people spread their bubbles they started adding people to it and having additional. And again, you know, there's nothing that's risk-free. Outside Thanksgiving is better than inside Thanksgiving, but it's not as good as keeping Thanksgiving with your nuclear family. And so I think it's hard to talk about only one risk, but to think about the breadth of risk that each household member may have. That was awesome. Uh, thank you guys for that discussion. Um, I'm gonna move on to a, another question. Um, and these are uh, actually a set of questions, and these were for Dr. Gandhi. Um, so the first question is, uh, what are more likely conditions and higher risk activities that can lead to COVID infections for both adults and children and why? And then the second question is, why do cloth masks help decrease the incidence of respiratory virus spread? 
viruses are small. Shouldn't everyone be required to wear an N95 mask? Uh, what about face coverings such as shields and goggles? Okay, great. Well, those are good questions. And um, I'm actually going to share a few slides, if that's okay, um, relevant to uh, some of these questions. Um, so, you know, uh, when you said what would it take uh, to sort of keep our, what are our main mitigation measures? The ones that are enacted in schools um, are what we call these NPIs or non-pharmaceutical interventions. And they are masking, distancing, hand hygiene, and ventilation. And really, um, these have been keeping hospital systems safe, uh, clinics safe, gro uh, grocery stores safe. I mean, there are many places that have been open with these NPIs uh, that have been really safe. In terms of the question that you just asked, which was about a specific type of masks, you're right that the um, that the CDC put out their recommendations on April 3rd about cloth face coverings. Why? Because um, there was sort of evidence at, at that point how much asymptomatic transmission there was, how much shedding from your nose and mouth even when you feel well. And the cloth face mask covering is adequate um, sort of based on influenza and other diseases to prevent transmission to others. However, the message was updated in California in September and then by the CDC on November 9th um, that masks actually, even cloth face masks, protect others and you. And where is that data coming from? Really, it's coming from the fact that since April 3rd, there have been many counties in the United States, many places around the world that have used cloth face coverings. And um, there's been reduced transmission of COVID during that time. So that's epidemiologic observational evidence. For, uh, I'll give you some examples in a minute. And then the other is from the physical science literature, which is that they can sort of by putting a mask on a mannequin, they can spray different aerosols and droplets mixed together and figure out how much doesn't get into you. And I'll give you very specifics to answer your N95 question in a minute. Um, in terms of the epidemiologic evidence, and again, this is in the setting because um, the CDC has recommended cloth face mask coverings instead of N95s for the public. Um, there's evidence from healthcare worker settings. This is up on the left from JAMA, but healthcare worker settings that as soon as we started surgical mask uh, wearing in the hospitals that we, there was a reduction in transmission. There's evidence um, on the bottom right from Arizona where they put in various mitigation procedures over the summer when cases were surging, including mask requirements, limited public events and closures of certain businesses, and uh, a really nice reduction in, in um, transmission. And then of course, a lot of people have heard of these two hairstylists who are in um, Missouri and they were both infected with COVID-19 and um, they served 139 clients and everyone was wearing cloth face coverings and no one got sick. Um, and then uh, it, it, good examples from sort of um, what we call ecologic data, but um, in Kansas, the state said that there should be a mask mandate, but half the counties used it and half the counties said no mask mandate. And in the counties that used a mask mandate that imposed a mask mandate, um, there was a 50% reduction in transmission. Um, and that was again with this cloth face coverings that are recommended by the CDC. And then, um, uh, and then kind of a, a natural experiment in states, but with face mask use, we would see um, case numbers going down uh, between April and May with that first surge of infection. So masks um, sort of epidemiologically seem to make a difference. And then what's the physical science evidence? I will say that, um, uh, that this has been pushed uh, in this country by the NIH, by the CDC, uh, how important um, face coverings are. But um, unfortunately, we've had mixed messaging up to this point. In terms of this question that you asked about the, the specific impact about certain kind of masks. Um, I will go to that section, but essentially um, there's physical sciences data that N95s, you're right, they're made out of these kind of um, um, uh, mesh material. They are um, 
They are very tight fitting and they filter out about 90 to 95% of viral particles. However, depending on the type of mask and how well it fits, they filter out 85, up to 85% of viral particles. And what do we recommend? And I just wrote an article actually with a physical scientist who wrote some very, who showed some really nice evidence for this. What's recommended is for maximal protection um, for the public. And I think what simulates an N95, why have we reserved N95s for healthcare workers? Unfortunately, because of shortages, um, but not just because of that, but because of the discomfort of wearing an N95 all day. So what simulates an N95 for the public is a mask that is either a um, surgical mask with a cloth mask on top of it or a very high thread count cloth mask. And so it has to be at least two ply and it's that high thread count that simulates the mesh material um, of the uh, polypropylene mask uh, that's in an N95. So we don't recommend single layer. We don't recommend neck gaiters. We don't recommend mesh. Um, we really recommend those kind of high thread count cloth face masks for the public. And there's been a lot of data. If you look at the CDC um, updated guidance on masks protecting you and others from November 9th, it's actually a scientific brief that goes through all the evidence of how physical sciences literature has shown us um, that these kind of high quality cloth masks protect the public. Um, and I won't go into this now because no one asked, but um, <laughs> but I will say that it's not just um, it's not just um, reduction of COVID nineteen transmission, but there's accumulating evidence that masks, um, even if a little bit gets in, reduces the um, severity of disease, just like vaccines are trying to do. That's actually the main end point of vaccine trials, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine trials. Their end point is to look at reduction or law, a 94% reduction in symptomatic disease. And in settings that are masking, um, we have seen a reduction in the severity of disease and an increase in asymptomatic infection if there are infections. Um, and that is a good thing because we want asymptomatic disease. We obviously want to reduce the severity of disease. And so I think masks are a pillar for, for a number of different um, reasons. And I'm happy to go into those more, but that answers the question, I think, of the N95 mask question and the pillars, I think, of of non-pharmaceutical interventions that we use in schools to mitigate transmission. Dr. Gandhi, I had um, one follow-up question that dovetails off that, and uh, which is um, if one person is wearing a mask and they get 85% protection, um, how much further protection do you get if your partner on the other side is also wearing a mask? Um, is there an additive effect of, of having a community of people wearing masks around you? Yes. So what that by the CDC really went over is there's two, um, they use two phrases actually. One is source control. So that phrase is that you don't put out particles um, when you're wearing a mask because it blocks it. And then there's what's called personal filtration efficiency that you also don't get in particles. So it's additive really to have both people wearing a mask, um, which is why um, uh, and I think there's one other question I'll ask here, but it's a great question. Um, it's why uh, I think mask is such a it, such a pillar because the more people in the community the wear it, the better. And so models have shown about 80% of the community has to wear a mask to mitigate transmission. And so if there is one child who takes off their mask, um, you know, with those kind of modeling, it does make you feel better that it's sort of 80%, not 100%. And then I think I would reiterate what others have said on this call is that children, especially young children, are actually quite resilient and get used to things quite quickly. Um, and we haven't seen evidence in all these elementary schools that have opened that children are so apt to take them off um, because it almost becomes, they're more resilient than, than adults who, who you know, are so not used to wearing a mask and children sort of make it part of their, their, their day. And you'll hear these young children say, well, I feel naked without my mask. So they're, they're kind of growing up with this. So I'm not concerned about the younger children. Older children, I guess that's fair that you can say that they, um, 
they could be more rebellious, but I think kids want to be in school and I think they'll wear their masks so personally. So, um, so I think uh, to Manfred's point, uh, point, I think it's a very good point that this is really about behavior. And there is a lot of um, aspects of people where a lot of people around you wearing masks that make you want to wear masks. And um, I, 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 we have not seen that as a, as a major um, slippage, I think, in schools that have been open so far. I can add that from all reports we have that students are so happy to be back at school on campus are really diligently following rules. This is coming from districts all across the county um, and having really very little issue with wearing their face coverings. And I mean, one other thing, because someone asked a question about filter. Um, yes, I think that uh, this is right. If you want kind of basic protection, and I'm quite comfortable with my children having that basic protection, because I know masks, other people are wearing masks, and they're wearing masks, so I'm okay with the surgical mask, or a very high quality cotton mask, which has the high thread count, but for maximal protection, and this is what I instruct my elderly parents, you're right that the filter um, between two layers, so there's like a soft outer layer and a soft inner layer, and then putting that filter in between like a vacuum bag is as maximal protection as you can get. And um, it's about literally filters out 90% of both aerosols and droplets. So it's kind of amazing how, what we can do with a filter in between two pieces of cloth. That's great. Um, I'm gonna, I want to switch gears real quick because uh, that was a really great discussion. But we've touched base on behavior. Uh, and one of the things that uh, has come up is not just in this era, is not just uh, what happens uh, with COVID infections and how it relates to children, but um, some of the collateral damage uh, from this era. Um, and so this question is for Dr. Singh. Um, it's uh, I struggle with balancing my child's social emotional well being, meeting their educational needs, and minimizing risk of harm from COVID 19. Can you speak to the impact of the COVID 19 era on children's mental health, especially with regards to potential physical isolation away from peers and role models? Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me for this very interesting discussion. Um, first and foremost, as a as a fellow parent, um, I think one of the realizations I had is regardless of what stage your child is in development, it's helpful for parents to consider a child's need for structure, education, exercise, social contact, appropriate leisure time, and calm, rational explanations about the situation. There are a number of ways that we as adults are reacting to this um, to this pandemic. And there was a question actually about how do we manage our own stress as parents? And it is very critical that we care and um, nurture ourselves. It's modeling behavior that if you can take care of your own mental well-being, um, you're modeling it for your child. Um, but open up the conversation. And it's not necessarily probing them about, you know, um, so are you worried, worried about it or instigating? anything but just be curious with them and ask them and meet them where they are developmentally because there will be a lot of discussions about things that they ascribe to themselves um, blaming themselves for things that aren't necessarily uh, their fault um, this is a natural inclination depending on the stage of development but those clear, calm, rational explanations can be very tough to do when you're stressed out yourself and you're uncertain yourself. So as best you can. Um, and, uh, and there are a number of parenting groups and, and um, parenting uh, uh, strategies that can be implemented at our division um, hosts a number of those at Stanford. So um, you can certainly check those out. Some of them are available for public, um, for, for public interest. Um, and then I, you know, getting back to the question about what the impact is, now there are a number of studies that have come out that have uh, observed um, uh, the uh, impact of the pandemic on behaviors. Um, and you can imagine that less vitamin D exposure by being in sheltered in, um, you can imagine the um, lack of uh, social connection. Um, and also if kids are predisposed to mental health conditions that um, need intervention, um, those are not available um, or as accessible or they're done now via telehealth, which um, is 
certainly better for access and convenience. Um, but as a practitioner now watching some of the behaviors that I see in my office um, now in the comfort of, of family homes, some of those behaviors aren't so adaptive. Um, and, uh, and so we're struggling to figure out ways to help um, families engage in more adaptive communication strategies and, um, and to uh, problem solve together through this, through this stressful time. It's also important to keep in mind that social isolation in and of itself, there's a neuroscience basis to it. People think that, you know, being lonely is, is a subjective experience. We can actually cross species, experimentally manipulate loneliness and understand the neural circuits behind it. And strangely enough, we, we've discovered that um, the same regions in the midbrain that are really important for loneliness um, also um, uh, trigger cravings um, for food and um, for um, addictive, um, um, uh, behaviors. And so how can we leverage or, or reframe those behaviors around more structured routines on more adaptive choices? Um, those are things that parents can think about um, uh, in incorporating into their interactions with kids. Um, I hope those nuggets are helpful in terms of just things that you can do as a, as a parent, um, not just modeling routines for yourself, getting kids up, even if they are distance learning at the same time every day and um, structuring their days around um, the, the usual um, routines that they have while they're in school is, is critical. I do think that there is some value in in-person. Um, uh, we lose something, let's just say, from distance learning. I'm not sure that we have data quite yet, comparative data quite yet, to, dis to say definitively that distance learning is equivocal to <laughs> in-person learning. I think there's definitely going to be differences that um, need to be understood. Uh, better. Um, and probably all of my experiments um, scientifically are going to be confounded by the pandemic um, in perpetuity now before and then after. Um, but, but nevertheless, um, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't undermine or, or minimize the impact of not having human physical human contact. So um, uh, strategies to mitigate risk um, of uh, exposure and spread um, need to be balanced um, with the important um, developmental needs of children to have interactions, um, uh, connections, social connections with, with others, peers and, and, uh, and teachers. And Dr. Singh, I would say that um, our safe and supportive schools team that's supporting districts across the county and social emotional learning and mental health have reported um, alarming spikes in distress um, from students. And we know that um, research tells us that it's connecting to a caring adult at school is one of the key foundations of resilience for children being successful through life. Well, it, it turns out that resilience, um, a core feature of resilience is um, pro-social behaviors. So um, we've now also understood that our capacity to be resilient really hinges on our capacity to connect with others. Um, and so that's, that's, that's definitely clear. Um, I guess what I would also um, just convey from a science perspective, epidemiologically, it's curious that we haven't seen tremendous increases in rates of suicide, even though anecdotally we're seeing them in our units, we're seeing, um, you know, a dis certainly distress. I want to mention that actually, um, even before the pandemic, depression was the leading cause of global health burden. So worldwide, um, depression is the leading cause of global health burden. And this was an issue before. The pandemic has just exposed this issue and made it um, potentially more, more problematic. And functionally, we have work to do to meet that unmet need. Uh, certainly that's been my uh, anecdotal experience um, this year is our uh, rates of self-harm are uh, and serious self-harm are, are way up uh, compared to uh, previous years. And it sort of ebbs and flows, but um, it's not uncommon to have two to three overdoses uh, admitted to my ICU a week these days, which is typically would be more like two to three a month. Um, so I wanna um, move on to uh, another question. And this, and this really has to do with um, the um, child as part of a family unit. Um, and I want to give this one to Dr. Atkinson McAvoy. Uh, she touched on this earlier. Um, the question is, while I worry about my children's health, we also live with my elderly parents. If my child were to attend in-person learning, what can I do to protect my family? 
I think this is important. Um, I think uh, lots of families have actually moved closer together in the pandemic, moved their elderly parents to come be closer for caretaking. Um, so, you know, knowing that um, the more exposures and the more high risk those exposures are, the greater your risk of being exposed to COVID. If um, your priority is the health of the elderly um, parents and your children's mental health and educational health, that might be the only sorts of exposures that you have. Your kids go to school, they wear masks, but they don't go to parties. Um, you know, they might do a distant outdoor activities, but they're not doing an in-person indoor activity with a lot of other children. So it's really sort of thinking about um, what's the health of your parents, um, what will keep your children happy and healthy, and how much you're going to prioritize education for them. I would just also go so far as to say that if you're very concerned there can if or there's been an exposure, there can be masking in the home. And there are kind of multiple settings um, in East Asia where there is more masking in the home environment, um, especially if there's been an exposure. So we had an exposure at school and my elderly parents were there and we just had the, in this case, we had the child mask because he's really good with it, mm -hmm. better than my dad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, that, that was awesome. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, I have another question. Now, uh, this one I'll give to Dr. Chaya. Um, the, this is, I always feel like these questions are sometimes uh, like the Monty Python skit, you know, what is my favorite color? And then all of a sudden, what is the um, average wind velocity of a, you know, coconut carrying swallow? Um, the, this question has to do with uh, uh, surfaces. Um, so the, Potential transmission of the virus was, from surfaces was in the news a lot initially, uh, with some reports suggesting that it can survive for days. Uh, can you comment on one, the likelihood of transmission from surface contact, two, the efficacy and safety of sanitization methods used to clean surfaces, and three, practical concerns about utilizing public restrooms? That's that's a super easy question, um, and uh, certainly multi-part and. Um, uh, take it away uh, and uh, anybody else who wants to jump in. Yeah, definitely. I'll start us off and then maybe my infectious disease colleagues can uh, polish me up a little bit here. Um, but I mean, they're correct in the, in the beginning of this pandemic, there was a lot of, I think, anxiety about surfaces. And I think that for me, that goes back to us not knowing a lot in the beginning about the virus, um, not knowing exactly how it was transmitted, what the risks were. And so um, in the very beginning, people were just taking any precaution possible um, as we had more time to learn about um, how the virus was transmitted. And I think now that we've had so many months behind us, we know a bit better how it is transmitted. Um, and we feel comfortable that the main mode of transmission is through droplets which um, for the majority, vast majority of cases will be, you know, one person near another person who then spreads their droplets in the air, um, which is why there's been so much talk today about the importance of masking. Um, that said, with any droplet, um, any disease that is spread by droplets, there is that risk that if a droplet lands on a surface, you touch the surface, and then you touch one of your mucous membranes, you could transmit that droplet to your surfaces. And so, um, I, I still think that there's some just rational thought about, um, you know, cleaning high touch surfaces and washing your hands. And so hand washing is going to probably be the main way that we prevent transmission from droplets that have landed on surfaces. Um, and so that can be done very economically and very easily by, you know, children and adults alike. Um, and then also, again, we, we, we really want to focus on the high touch surfaces to clean um when we're talking about school settings and so i think and luckily the virus itself is very um easily destroyed by things like soap and water um and simple sanity you know hand sanitizer so it's not difficult to kill the virus um it just takes some common sense hygiene i think um and then that kind of leads me i guess to the question about the bathrooms because i know there's been a lot of talk about bathrooms public bathrooms are closed everywhere <laughs> you can't find one um to me, I do think, again, it comes down to just basic hygiene. And as we always want to do, we want to wash our hands after using the restroom for multiple reasons. Um, and so it's just another reason to remember to do that. Got it, got it. Oops, 
And, um, you know, I think while you're in there, you might as well keep your mask on, you know? And so I, I just think it goes to the basics that we've been talking about all night. Um, I'm not so sure the, the bathroom per se concerns me more than other um, areas that you would be in. Um, and we should just follow the hygiene our family, our parents taught us <laughs> about using the bathroom. I would just add one thing about surfaces. I think that's exactly right. I think it really went away this entire issue because um, you uh, you can culture viruses from any surface. I can culture virus from my skin for nine hours, 20 hours. You know, that was all those studies are useless. These are environmental studies where you can culture influenza from surfaces as well. That is not the predominant route of spread. That is actually the reason that it was even thought about at the beginning is we could not figure out why it was spreading so fast. And the reason it spread so fast is you can spread it from your nose and mouth even when you feel well. That's weird. Influenza doesn't do that. Other diseases do, don't do that. You feel ill when you're spreading it. And so because of that, that's why the mask is so important. You can culture it from anything you want, including stool, which by the way, stool kills it. Um, and it doesn't, <laughs> the gross stuff in stool, and it does it, you can, uh, uh, um, and you can't get it that way. So I think all this disinfectant, I want to start thinking about the environmental implications for that as well. Um, and uh, we need to calm down in terms of surfaces and, and full lines. And the, and the, what we talk about in terms of cleaning surfaces, is, uh, which um, is part of our uh, disinfectant process or sanitization process is using like boggers and things like that. And there's always a question about, uh, is that safe and is it effective? Now, you know, I can imagine that it gets in the nooks and crannies and has to be dry before people show up. But um, I don't really have a great sense of, uh, is that an okay method and is it safe for anybody to be around? You would have to like have a hundred people sneeze on one surface to get the amount of virus for your hand to pick it up and put it in your nose for you to get transmission. So what I mean is just basic disinfecting, basic cleaning is absolutely adequate. And um, I think I do understand why that even came up uh, because a lot of physical scientists got in the mix and they, and they cultured it from surfaces. And I think that caused confusion. Okay, um, I'm going to move on to another question, and this can be uh, either for Jackie or Lee. Um, and this is about children uh, having difficulty with their masks. So um, some children have sensory issues or are young and may not be able to tolerate wearing a face covering while on campus. Um, we talked about this a little bit before. Are there common medical issues that would prevent someone from wearing a face covering? If my child is cohorted with an individual that has a legitimate reason not to wear a face mask or covering, what should sh what concern should I have about my child's health? And at what age should children be wearing face coverings? Um, so I will take a stab to start. So generally it's two years of age and older. Some of it is tolerance, but some of it is concern about obstructing the airway. So anyone who has a compromised airway is sort of, for me, uh, anatomically compromised or uh, insufficient at baseline. They're not walking around, breathing normally otherwise, would be somebody who I would say shouldn't wear a mask who's over that age. If you think about seat belts, seat belts are really uncomfortable, right? Kids who have sensory issues, who are young, who need to be in car seats for a long time, those families can struggle with that. But there is an opportunity to find the right car seat and the right seat belt and get your child to learn how to tolerate that. And I see masks the same way. All of us, when this started, I'm not a surgeon, I don't wear masks, you know, so to get used to wearing it in my everyday life took some getting used to. And so it's practice. And so in this period of time, when we're thinking about kids going back to school, that is the opportunity to allow kids to practice reward them. They work for five minutes, they work for 10 minutes without touching it, and they can build up a tolerance to do it. So there's not a lot of conditions that are true contraindications to wearing a mask. And again, the issue around it protects your own child to wear a mask, just like wearing a seatbelt means that if there's a collision, your child can be saved, should really be the priority that would make this um, a concern that you would work with your child on it. Um, 
there's different fabrics. They may not be as great as like a really sturdy cotton. There's the ability to uh, sew in a lining that makes it more tolerable. So there are things that you can do to allow them to have a face covering that they'd be able to wear. And that's one of the good reasons that we all don't have to wear N95 masks because those are really uncomfortable to wear all the time. So the fact that kids can have beautiful cloth masks that they can pick the fabric that works for them is a reason where the overwhelming majority of children over the age of two can successfully mask. So um, uh, just getting back to that second part of that question, um, and maybe this is better for either uh, Dr. Shea or Dr. Gandhi. Um, if there is one child in the classroom that's cohorted with the rest that can't wear a, um, a face mask for whatever particular reason, um, how big a health concern is that for everyone else if all the other pillars of, the, of, of reopening are being followed? Yes, I would say that again, um, these models show that almost everyone has to wear a mask, but not everyone. And so um, I definitely think that children with uh, a, um, a sensory deficit or it's too difficult. Uh, you have everyone else masking around them and I think it can absolutely be accommodated. And uh, uh, I think that the, the, this is the, especially this is the place where it can be accommodated. There are a lot of clear and transparent masks actually as well um, for hearing um, where there's hearing difficulties. Is, um, and so you can also think about like what would work for them, but one or two not wearing a mask. I think we also have to do no harm. Um, so for example, we opened our school and someone had such a severe reaction to testing an older child um, that we that's the one ch a child that's not gonna get tested because they had a reaction to the swap. We also have to do no harm when we do our mitigation procedures. And I, I do also not want to add that, you know, transmission in the school starts at home. So, you know, we as our as the adults going out in the community and 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 you know work and, and doing the activities that are essential like grocery shopping and stuff, th those are the places where where we're going to bring home the risk for our families. And then when, if we spread it to our children, they're the ones who would then take it to school. That's more likely where the transmission is going to come from than from the school. The community transmission is where we bring the virus into our households. And then because we can be most contagious in the 24 to 48 hours before we have symptoms, you know, that, that is why universal masking for us as the adults who can tolerate this, we should be the ones that are in the front lines of wearing our masks and trying to make good decisions. This is anecdotal, but the overwhelming majority of positive uh, cases that I've seen, the source has been the parent. And these are kids, um, I practice in San Francisco where private schools have gone back and some of these kids have gone back to school and the source has been mom, dad, um, older babysitter sort of thing, not school, not teacher, because at those schools, they're observing all of the behavioral things that you can do to keep, keep things safe. No, absolutely, I'll just concur. I work in San Mateo County and that's exactly what we've seen as well. And I do wanna just add one more thing. You know, in the past as working parents, we sometimes let our kids go to school when they really shouldn't. They have that runny nose and we're like, oh, it's okay, you're fine. You don't technically have a fever. We're just gonna slip you in under the radar. Those days are gone, okay? We can't do that anymore. We can't let our kids slide into school if they have new onset respiratory symptoms and we don't have an explanation for that because those may be the kids that will, are carrying the virus and if for whatever reason they're not wearing their mask properly, that's when the risk comes in. So it's going to be hard because we have to work and we have to figure it out. But we can't let those be, and work too. This is this is important in the hospital and the work setting too. You know, we have new symptoms as an adult. Oh, it's okay. I'm just going to go to work. That's when we run the risk because we find out a, two, a day or two later. Oh my gosh, I had COVID and I went to the hospital. This has happened. We have seen, not here, we have, I've seen it as in other, other locations. And it's because the people are slipping into work when they really shouldn't be going. So we have to be honest with ourselves and call it out. You know, do, do what I can to protect myself. But if I've got new symptoms, I really shouldn't be putting others at risk. That's great. Uh, the, um, I'm glad that you brought that up, Charlotte. Um, sorry, Dr. Shea. Um, <laughs> So uh, that actually uh, is uh, connected to the next question that I had on my list, which is that, um, uh, and this one is for uh, Ms. Sanchez. Um, and uh, the question is, part of the conditions for a low risk environment includes 
health symptom screening. Uh, in other words, keep, keeping symptomatic children and adults off campus. Why it is allowable for an individual to report to campus if they have only one symptom associated with COVID-19, in other words, like a cough and no fever, et cetera, et cetera, uh, shouldn't that person be in quarantine? Um, and I think that that really has, it, the question is really about new symptoms versus symptoms that you can account for from a pre-existing condition, is it not? Yeah, if, I'm gonna actually share my screen to show um, a flow chart that our communicable disease team created. Is it popping up or not yet? We can't see it yet, Liz. No. Okay, let me try again. Liz, while we're waiting, I have a random, almost totally random question. I love this question because it's been out there, but I, I have no idea who's going to be able to answer this. Um, and if, oh, go ahead. Let's do yours first. Okay. Let's see. So, yeah, exactly what you were saying. So, this is a flowchart that the um, communicable disease team created. And I think they were refer the question was referring to the class B symptoms. So, like you said, it's excluding pre existing, long standing conditions. Um, or symptoms that can be attributed to another diagnosis other than COVID-19. Um, so here, um, where it, so the flowchart asks if there's any class A symptoms. So the class A symptoms would be like fever, cough, shortness of breath, pneumonia, a new loss of taste or smell, or painful purple, red, or red lesions. Um, and then it asks here two or more class B symptoms, which are the ones that usually you see in other illnesses. So they're gonna be a lot of overlapping things. So um, even things for like allergies or asthma, there's gonna be a lot of these. Um, so that's why we have to consider the pre-existing or long-standing symptoms. But when you go here, even if it says, if you have one class B symptom, um, they still suggest medical evaluation and COVID testing. So just contacting your healthcare provider to. Um, try to make a diagnosis. Of course, we don't want to just, if you have a cough, just immediately think it's, uh, it's like asthma or something else that you might uh, normally uh, be living with. We always want you to contact your healthcare provider so they can make the call. We don't want, um, we don't want uh, kids to be sent to school if they are having any of these symptoms that they might have otherwise had with um, other conditions. Um, and this is this flowchart is shared in the pandemic framework. So um, parents and teachers and everyone has access to this uh, this flowchart. I just wanted to add, um, you know, the pediatric support here in San Mateo County. This flowchart was just released recently, um, and it is incredibly helpful, I think, for the local pediatricians that are going to be on the teams with the schools here, figuring out what to do with the individual children that are sick. Um, and so I found it incredibly helpful already in trying to triage our patients and um, figure out who needs to be tested or not. And um, as Liz mentioned, it's really anyone that we suspect has a viral illness would need a test prior to returning. Um, one example I had of a child recently who I did not test was a child who has a history of migraine headaches, got a headache at school, came home, was resolved by the next day when I saw her. And I felt pretty comfortable saying that that was just one of her typical um, migraines. And so that gives me the option as a pediatrician to use my clinical judgment. Um, but if I had any suspicion that it was a viral illness, then we would ask her to be tested um, prior to return. So it's, been, it's gonna be a team effort moving forward here with the pediatricians and the school districts. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I think that that's a big part of the reason we got this panel together is that really we need public health, um, uh, medical providers, and uh, different organizations like school districts to be working together as we move through this um, uh, pandemic. Um, so this is a, a little bit of a random question. I don't know if anybody knows the answer to this. I certainly don't. Um, the question is, prolonged shutdown of some facilities have been associated with uh, water safety issues, such as Legionella infections, AKA Legionnaire's disease and mold. What conditions make this more likely or less likely? I have no idea 
whose uh, wheelhouse that belongs in. I mean, it's also okay to everybody go, uh, I don't know. <laughs> All right, great. I'm going to take that as a nobody really knows for sure. Um, let's move on to the next one. Uh, we'll try and look that up for people and put it on an FAQ. Um, this is uh, germane uh, to our discussion. Um, there has been a lot of lot in the news lately about the impact of holiday travel and activities on the current surge. Can you comment on the types of behavior outside of campus that will promote or mitigate the surge? And that's for whoever wants to take it on. I could just start by saying that uh, you, when you have an exposure to somebody with COVID and they could not know that they have it yet because they could be in that asymptomatic stage a couple days before, you know, on average, after you've been exposed to a person, you know, you may start developing symptoms anywhere between two days and 14 days, but on average is about six days. So we've seen across the country, at least it's, it really seems that way based on the trends, that every time we have large events, whether it's rallies, you know, protests for the election, uh, whether it's Halloween and parties and, and the such, uh, whether it's Thanksgiving and more air travel and what have you, is that the surge starts to happen within a couple of weeks or so afterwards. So you won't see the effect right away. It takes six days-ish for the first wave to develop symptoms. And of course they've been around people. So then they'll spread it to the next wave over the next six or so days, they'll start to see the second wave. So, so we'll see the effects of Thanksgiving probably around mid to later December. It, 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 it'll, it'll declare itself as, you know, how well did we do during this past holiday season? And then of course with the holiday season, winter vacations and things or whatever you wanna call it, the holidays coming up, um, that, that will then of course increase the risk for us to see what will the outcome be in January. As, as we gather more indoors, you know, our air ventilation is not gonna be as good. As the air becomes more dry, our mucous membranes aren't gonna do as well in defending against viruses and things. And so these factors in the winter will contribute more for transmission. Uh, and so if we do end up spending time with people who are not inside our pod, who they may think, oh, I'm just gonna have this person visit I haven't seen in a long time, it'll be okay. But that person has also said the same thing to somebody else. Our pod, which originally was wait, one family or two families can suddenly be very large and each person in the pod has made that one exception to seeing somebody else. Um, and it is a challenge because it is hard to balance that with the need for social connection. You know, we, we need, we're social creatures, we need that, but we have to balance that. And as it gets colder, it's gonna be harder to do this outside. You know. It's going to be raining, so we're not going to be able to do this outside. Uh, so it is going to be more of a challenge as we enter this season, on top of mixing influenza and respiratory syncytial virus and all the other viruses that are really common that kids are really good at spreading because that's the, the typical type of virus is very easily spread among our young kids, different from coronavirus per se. Um, it's, it's going to make it a really interesting and challenging, unfortunately, winter. Uh, so if you haven't gotten your influenza vaccine, please Go get your vaccine from your, your doctors so that you can protect your household and your children and the older folks in your home because it is confusing. It's hard to tell what's influenza and what's COVID. And so if we can mitigate one virus by using a vaccine that is available, you know, we can at least sort of filter or try to make that risk a little bit less um, in the confusing picture that's going to be coming. Thanks so much, Charlotte. The, um... That, that leads me into another question here that, uh, and this will be the last one I uh, choose as a, a pre-question. Um, so uh, uh, I was part of a presentation uh, the other day where um, we talked about uh, how winter conditions not only promote spread because of you know, the closeness and the indoor conditions and all that sort of stuff, but that uh, the likelihood of uh, cold dry conditions are more likely to generate aerosols from droplets than warm human conditions. Um, and uh, I wonder if somebody would be willing to talk about the importance of ventilation uh, for mitigating aerosol spread um, and uh, what, uh, what kind of uh, ventilation uh, uh, do we need uh, to uh, have an effective mitigation uh, intervention. 
I can say that the pandemic recovery framework um, suggests that schools replace their uh, filters in their HVAC systems and use the, the highest quality filter that they can, um, that the system can take, um, and that they replace the filters twice a year. Normally, it's done much less frequently than that. And then um, there's just a, a suggestion, too, about opening windows, uh, getting some cross flow in the classroom, um, doing lessons outside if you can, if the weather allows and any time that that's something that can be worked inside or, or worked into the schedule. Um, and then um, I would put a plug in for schools of the future need to have, um, you know, air and ventilation filtration systems that allow kids to go to school and stay in school, whether there's fire, smoke, power outages, or a pandemic. Um, our kids are really suffering in California from not being able to stay inside the, the school buildings um, amid all the environmental elements that are happening. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Nancy. And uh, was there anybody, so the, the really interesting thing I saw about um, ventilation and, and Dan, you might be able to speak to this a little bit, the, um, was that there was there's basically so many air um, exchanges that you need to do per hour, I guess, um, to to minimize um, aerosol mediated spread of the of the virus, um, uh, and I think the magic number out there is four. Um, and so, uh, do you know if the uh, district um, has been able to achieve that uh, with our current HVAC system, um, or is that something that we can uh, turf to? Uh, Ms. Bao, and she can answer later on. I uh, yeah, so I would I uh, I would defer to Ms. Bao. However, I will say um, all of our district classrooms use um, MERV thirteen filters. I just put this in the chat. MERV thirteen is is the equivalent of HEPA, but it's for HVAC systems. Um, and we've been working with our uh, maintenance and operation team to examine airflow to check all the airflow across our our um, uh, systems and also ensure that. Uh, they're pulling in air when they should be and not pulling air when they shouldn't be. Um, so uh, really, really making sure that all the filtration systems are um, uh, above board and on par with what we would expect. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, so Neil, uh, I, I know you've been answering questions all along uh, from the chat as we've been going through. Um, were there any particular uh, questions uh, that you uh, thought we might want to address before we uh, conclude our session? We've got about uh, seven minutes left. Sure, so there's a billion questions in the seven minutes left. Uh, but first of all, thank you to all of the parents for, um, for uh, joining us and a lot of respect for everything that that you have been doing to support your children and just know that we are here right with you to help uh, help us as we go forward. Um, there were a lot of questions on the chat. I'm sure there is a way that we will try to um, convert most of these questions, if not all into an FAQ and I'll look to, to Superintendent Degara to help to help with that. Um, the uh, Jim, I'll let you, I'll defer to you as the moderator, but um, there are many, many questions, but the, the maybe two that I anticipate that I wouldn't have enough time for for most of them. One there was a, some discussion about high risk children and whether we as um, experts, do we, do we think that for instance, type one diabetes or are there, are there a list of diagnoses that you would say dis, uh, in, would, in, would disqualify or encourage um, uh, families to st uh, stick to distance learning? In other words, are there pre-existing conditions that um, would make you a particularly high risk for um, becoming infected with COVID? Right. And so is there a set list, one? Um, and then the second thing I think is just uh, uh, families were looking for practical discussions. I'm sorry. Um, well, why don't we ask, uh, Dr. Shea, why don't, you, why don't we ask you that question? Is there a particular kind of medical conditions that would particularly add particularly high risk uh, for um, acquiring a uh, COVID-19 infection? Yes, it's a good, it's a great question. Um, there, there are definitely some conditions that patients can have that would put them at risk for more complicated uh, COVID infection, even in children. We, we have seen a few patients come through our ICU or Dr. Howard, um, and, and some of them have pre-existing conditions and some of them don't have anything. They were previously healthy. 
So, so we know that COVID can hit all, every child differently. Uh, if you have immune compromise in any way on medications that compromise your immune system, born with uh, a deficiency in your immune system, there is a chance that COVID will hit you in a more severe way than someone not. But you know, clearly you can be completely normal, normal immune system and have difficulties as well. Uh, we know that children who are, are overweight can have a slightly higher risk for, for problems in terms of breathing. Um, and, and we also know that underlying asthma and lung issues can, can, can put you at risk for that too. So it, it's important to discuss your risks with your physician because your physician will know you the best, know your children the best. And so discussing with them, what are your, your child's risk factors uh, and, and how would that play a role in whether or not they should go back to an in-person learning uh, versus remain distance. Um, again, I, I believe that when we're ready to really roll out, uh, hopefully going back to school, that the school systems will all do their best to mitigate the risk uh, for our children there. Uh, and I, I believe firmly in that because I, I, I do believe that we need to eventually get back in the classroom. Uh, we just have to continue to do it safe. And it requires a, a partnership with our, our parents and our families, as well as our schools and our, our, our healthcare, our public health folks, um, because this is a team effort. Uh, but but I, I see it coming with the vaccine on the horizon. I see it coming, um, and and I have I have faith in that. Does that hit that for you? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Thank you very much. And then Neil, there was a second question, and this will be our last one. Um, okay, I think I'm going to ask for. I think it will end with Nancy. Um, is just a just a general statement about uh, why this is so variable amongst the different districts. And 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 a comment on on what we are doing to uh, to uh, mitigate that to make to try to make it not so. Yeah, I know it's um, it's confusing because we have 23 school districts in San Mateo County and over 100 private schools, and each school community can um, follow the guidance and the framework in the way in which they feel most comfortable. So school boards really are the decision makers in the public school communities. And some school boards have um, been more concerned um, with the level of positivity rates in their, in their local areas. Um, people have addressed in the chat that we have inequitable funding across the county. Um, it's not so much that schools and districts can't open because they don't have the funds to do so. It's more that um, well-resourced communities can engage in more activities and more planning and have all kinds of um, doctors and medical advisors as their parent community to help a school district move forward. But um, in the end, it's about, um, you know, it's really about the local context and we, we are very hyper-local in San Mateo County. So what's, what's right and good a direction for Belmont Redwood Shores is not necessarily the same for San Mateo Foster City. They, these are different communities with different school facilities, school grounds, a number of staffing, um, you know, all kinds of layers to what determines whether a school or a district is ready to move forward. Um, so like I said, of the 23 districts, 16 of our public school districts are moving forward. They have their plans for hybrid learning. The others are mostly the high school districts and the unified districts, which have, uh, it's really complicated at the high school level. So, um, most of our elementary districts are moving forward um, and we're in, um, asking everyone to you know, use an incremental approach. Um, we're providing as much support as possible. Really shout out to Liz Sanchez and the team at the County of San Mateo for all of their support and help. And um, I just think that we really need to balance um, what's what is the in the best interests of our students and their future success with the mitigation um, that we are able to take to reduce or slow um, the spread of the disease in a school community. And I feel fairly confident that um, 
schools are doing a great job of implementing the four pillars because we are not seeing um, tons and tons of positive cases exploding in schools. So I know how hard it is. I know it's challenging. I know it's upsetting. And, um, uh, you know, my kids are, are um, in, their, in their young 30s, thank goodness, and um, are now starting to have their own children. And um, I do believe that uh, we need to think about the long-term success of these students um, and, and what they can gain by being in person. Many kids can be um, learning in a distance way and, and really thriving in that way. And if districts can provide that avenue for those families that want to remain in distance learning, then er everyone gets their needs met. So I hope that's helpful, um, but I like the optimism of the vaccine just around the corner. Just throw that in. Yeah, I think we're hoping that, that that we're all hoping for that. It's been a long haul. Um, so uh, I just want to stop here and thank everybody for being here tonight. Um, you guys were an amazing panel. Uh, I'm just uh, more than delighted that we were able to get this collection of brains in the room together, uh, virtually at least, uh, and have this kind of multi-perspective discussion and really kind of an honest debate and a little bit of a deeper dive into some of these issues. I know we weren't able to uh, address every question that came through the chat or that was pre-submitted, um, but I think we got into some pretty important ones. Um, Neil and I were talking the other day about um, the panelists themselves and uh, you know what an honor it was to have this group together and how uh, a couple of different people had reached out to us and said, oh my gosh, it's all women. Oh my gosh, it's multicultural. And we like looked at each other and said, but these are the smart people that we turn to in our world <laughs> to ask questions. So to us, this is not a surprise. We work with smart women all the time. We work with in a multicultural setting all the time. And I'm just delighted that the representation of the smartest people that I know, or a group of a, a group, a big group of the smartest people that I know that I always want to think, what does Lee think? And what does Liz think? And what does Manpreet think? And what does Charlotte think? And what does Monica think? You know, like when I when I want to ask people questions, these are the people that I that I really want to turn to um, or are curious of what their perspective is. So thank you guys so much for being here. Um, there are a couple more events uh, coming up. One is uh, the UCSF CARES group. Um, Dr. A uh, Atkinson McAvoy is going to be presenting on December 3rd, I believe, uh, which should be Thursday. Um, there's gonna be an update on where we are and what we've learned uh, between uh, Dr. Atkinson McAvoy, Dr. Uh, Bardash, and um, I believe it's Dr. Frank. Um, all of who are very well informed on uh, COVID-19 and its impact on, on children's health. Um, and then uh, on January 12th, uh, we're gonna be having an educator uh, focused uh, forum uh, that's similar to this, um, except for the questions will be uh, derived from our educators. Um, really, we walk hand in hand with this experience uh, with our educators. And when we talk about our children's health and our concerns for their well-being. We're also, you know, our educators are really an extension of our family. And so, you know, our effort here is not only to protect our children, but to protect our educators and make sure that we can generate a low risk environment for everyone involved. So again, thank you guys so much for being here. And it was really truly an honor to um, participate in this whole thing with you. Uh, real quick before we wrap up again, I just a, a big thank you from the entire BRSSD staff. Um, I also want to share um, with folks uh, in attendance, we have multiple districts, so all the information will be posted on the BRSSD um, reopening website, uh, information from the slides, um, FAQs all allowed to our FAQs. Um, I will also share a transcript of this um, meeting as well as a video link with other superintendents uh, so that they can share with their communities as appropriate too. Again, I want to thank our panelists. It's been a fantastic evening, lots of great information. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us and supporting um, our work forward. I uh, wish everybody a great evening. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much.